Yo, what's up, Internet? It's your boy RJ, Roads Liberty. Uh, I'm doing a response video to Austin Peterson's recent podcast discussion with Cybabe. I forget her real name, but that's her internet name. Cybabe is sort of a mainstream, science, popular science sort of commentator, whatnot. She sounds like a pretty reasonably chill and, um, you know, whatever, not a bad person, I guess, from a personality standpoint. And she certainly understands the concerns of libertarians in a lot of areas. And I don't know if I would go so far as to call her sympathetic or empathetic to libertarian, um, issues or philosophy, but Austin and Cybabe were sort of debating uh, a couple topics, the topic of vaccinations and the topic of global warming. They didn't really get too deep into the global warming thing, I guess time constraints, and they got off topic a lot during the, um, during the conversation, but uh, I wanted to comment on sort of one of the issues they raised regarding vaccinations. So the question is whether or not people should be uh, mandated or coerced into getting vaccines. That's the first topic. And then the second topic is whether giving someone a disease is or can be construed as a violation of the non-aggression principle. So, starting with the first issue here, should um, individuals be forced by the government to get vaccines or to give vaccines to their children? A um, couple thoughts on that. I have a little bit of a headache, that's why I keep rubbing my head. First of all, I'm not so sure, but I think if you put your kids in public school, in a lot of areas in the United States at least, it's mandatory to give your kids certain types of vaccinations, booster shots as it were. Um, so that's something I don't have uh, the research in front of me right now. I just want to do this video sort of impromptu while driving. Whoa! Sorry about that. Uh, one take, one take, one take. So yeah, so... So, yeah, so I guess mandatory vaccination might already be a thing, first of all. Secondly, um, that's, you know, with regards to children who go to public school. But Austin raises the question, well, should have, what vaccinations should be mandatory? Just select ones like polio and measles, mumps, rubella, and that kind of thing, or should it be, you know, every uh, possible thing under the sun, you know, HPV and, uh, you know, swine flu and whatever, um, as it is, you know, you hear a lot of um, hype around certain vaccinations and, and pushing people to get them. Now, I wasn't going to touch on this much, I will touch on it briefly, Austin and Cybabe were, um, you know, sort of trying to dispel the notion that vaccinations cause autism. And I'm sort of ambivalent, or not ambivalent, I'm sort of ignorant, I guess you could say, on the real answer that I would um, believe there. I have heard anecdotal stories about parents who claim that their children came down with autism shortly after getting certain vaccinations. That's definitely not scientific. I'm aware of how anecdotal evidence is not scientific. So that's something I will disclose and disclaim. However, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if there were some link, even if it's very minor. Now, they did a good job at dispelling the issue of some of the heavy metals, like aluminum and mercury, that are in vaccines. 
and explaining that they're non bio um, available or they're not absorbed into the body and they're not at a lethal dose, for example, there's more um, heavy metals of um, uh, whatever I just said in like tuna fish or uh, uh, pears have aluminum in them and tuna fish have some sort of heavy metal in them that's in vaccines mercury and uh, so I found that informative now to get to the second part where I would really critique uh, oh, and for the record I don't think people should be forced to get vaccines at all except for by voluntary agreement. So if there were even a private school or an employer or a neighborhood where the land developer was selling the house directly to the homeowner under the stipulation that anyone who moves in there must have certain types of vaccinations done and that all future uh, residents must also abide by that. So it's sort of a lifetime contract if you sell your home to another person, you can only sell your home to people that have also been screened for having these vaccinations done and so forth. That's fine because it's voluntary. You don't have to move in there, right? But it's not a nationwide round everyone up and, and jam needles in their arms kind of scenario. Um, so that's the first thing. Should governments be able to mandate vaccinations? I say no. Psy Babe says yes. Austin Peterson says no. However, Austin Peterson says you really should get vaccines. They don't cause autism, which they certainly may not. I don't know for sure. Um, I'm willing to accept that they may not. However, Austin says you got to go get a vaccine. you got to go get your vaccines uh, done. Hmm. Well, and then he takes it to the next step, which is my second point of saying if you give someone a disease or a virus you're essentially violating the non-aggression principle that is quite the claim right so we can say that if I steal your property or if I punch you in the face I am violating non-aggression principle as long as I'm not acting in self-defense in some way or getting retribution if I just initiate aggression against you I'm violating the non-aggression principle. Clear-cut case. Great. Now, there's gray areas, right? So, if, you know, I own my land and, um, you know, I have a rake in my front yard and you're walking in my front yard without my permission and you step on the rake and the, and the handle flies up and smacks you in the head and you break your nose... Do you have a claim against me for the damage that was done to your face because you stepped on a rake in my yard? Is it even a factor to say that I didn't even invite you into my yard? So I, I wouldn't have stepped on my own rake, and if I did, who would I sue? I can't sue myself. So that's what you get for trespassing in my yard. That would be one way to look at it from the perspective of the non-aggression principle. Now, what if you did have permission, permission to be in my yard? So I said, hey, come on over to my house, and you're walking up to the front door, and you trip on my walkway. You know, the, the pavement isn't smooth, or there's a rake or something, or uh, uh, a tennis ball in the lawn, and you slip on it and fall and hurt yourself. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you know, I had permission to be on your property. You created an unsafe environment, and I was injured on your property. So, in, in effect you injured me um that's a gray area i mean where do we deduce from the non-aggression principle that simply being adversely affected by another person's property or choices is sufficient to create um an initiation of aggression and that type of harm that would be considered an initiation of aggression and under the non-aggression principle I'm not so sure we have that ability to deduce that type of harm. Uh, to give another example, if you borrow my bike and the seat is loose on the bicycle and it causes you to crash the bike and break your neck or something or break your ankle or whatever the case may be, is it 
the case that I have initiated aggression against you. Um, I would say that unless we had a contract for rental that said, that, that said, you know, I hereby assume the responsibility, that would be a caveat in the contract. If we had a verbal agreement, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it would be, I would lean more on the side of, hey, you know, there was no expectation of, you know, insured health while using this. But I would also encourage the renter of the bike or the lender of the bike to explicitly disavow their obligation legally, basically have some sort of use at your own risk type of rider. You see that all the time in swimming pools, water parks, hang gliding, uh, cable parks for wakeboarding and all sorts of things. You say, okay, if you want to have fun here, it's at your own risk, you know, skate parks, whatever. It's like, yeah, you know, you pay $10 to get in, but that doesn't cover the cost of your medical expenses if you fall down or hurt yourself. You know, we require you wear a helmet or we require that you get this waiver signed or whatever, but we're not here to make sure you're healthy in addition to just providing this experience. So, long way of getting there, but I wanted to kind of use those type of examples as um, an introduction to the question of disease and uh, viruses in the framework of harm as related to the non-aggression principle. So, you come over my house to watch Netflix or to play poker or whatever, and it turns out I have um, the flu. And we're playing poker, and maybe you accidentally pick up my cup and have a sip thinking it was your cup, or maybe... I cough into my hand and then I grab the chips and throw them into the pile and then you win that hand and take those chips and now you're playing with those chips and then you rub your nose and before you know it, you contracted the flu from me. Let's get past for the sake of this discussion. Let's assume we have the ability to know, which we probably don't very easily. Let's assume we have the ability to know whether person A was the transmitter of a disease or virus to person B. So you got sick, you were at my house. Let's assume you don't have to just speculate that you got sick because of me, because you knew I was sick and we have the same symptoms. Let's say you had a way of proving that you got your sickness from me. Do you have an expectation of health everywhere you go? I would say you don't, because I think that would fall under the condition or the, um, the category of a positive right. So you're saying, in, if you believe that, you're saying, I have a positive right to my health and everyone else has a um, duty to ensure that my health is protected without payment, without any kind of compensation outside of that being a mutual um, duty and right apparatus or, or diet, uh, paradigm that everyone would have to share. So if I go over your house, I have an uh, expectation that you will not get me sick. And if you go over my house, I have an expectation or you have an, <coughs> excuse me, you have an expectation that I won't get you sick. Is that warranted? Is that in accordance with how we understand positive and negative rights from a libertarian perspective and how is it in accordance with the type of harm that we would define as initiation of aggression under the non-aggression principle? Um, so I would say that it isn't. I would say that when you walk around in life, you have the obligation for your own health. If you have a compromised immune system or you have reason to believe that someone is health compromised or you're you know acting out of an abundance of caution and you go over someone's house and they don't indicate to you otherwise you know you should take it upon yourself to say hey before we hang out and play poker or go swimming or make out or whatever I want to know are you feeling sick in any way you know before I drink out of your cup or your beer bottle or whatever do you have anything that I could get? People ask those kind of questions. 
that's self-ownership to me. That's the individual looking out for the outcome of their own benefit or loss by factors that may be not qualified as an initiation of aggression, but just accidental harm. Just like tripping over something in my yard. I, I think it would be hard for you to show or make a case for that I invited you over with the hope that you would trip on something in my yard and I intentionally left all these obstacles out hoping and hiding them in such a way that you would trip and harm yourself and I could um, escape blame for that. That to me is a very special case that I think would require um, very careful um, you know, proof on the on the behalf of the person harmed to indicate that it wasn't um, accidental or blameless, but that in fact there was willful intent to do harm. Um, willful intent is a part of Western criminal law as it is. If that's why there's different types of vehicular manslaughter. There's I ran someone over because they had sex with my wife or girlfriend and I wanted to run them over and then there's I was driving and I had a leg spasm and I couldn't lift my leg off the gas pedal or I dropped a cigarette butt in my lap and I was burning and flipping out and my car crashed onto the sidewalk there's different degrees of blame for harm when you initiate quote unquote aggression in our current society so anyway, so kind of wrapping up the second part, I w uh, point I wanted to make here on the disease thing as it relates to vaccinations under the non-aggression principle is the disease is not even the same classification of entity as the rake in my yard or the bicycle that I let you borrow. It's not exactly property of mine that I am vouching for or configuring in such a way to where, hey, you left your rake in the yard, right? Hey, you knew that the seat bicycle bicycle seat wasn't tightened on right. Well, you had reason to know that or you didn't check before you let me borrow it, right? In those cases, I think there's even more of a case, even though I don't think there's a sufficient case. I think there's more of a case that can be made to blame the, uh, the party lending the bicycle or, or inviting the person over who was then harmed by the rake in the yard because they came in contact, willful contact, with those items. You know, I was riding the bike, I noticed the seat was loose, I put it in my shed, and I didn't uh, tighten it or remember to tighten it, and then I lent it out without checking. There's a lot of things that I had to do with there where I was part and parcel to it, even though I wouldn't consider myself initiating aggression upon you if you borrow it and don't check it yourself, right? Um, whereas with the virus and the disease, what about cases where I didn't even know I had a virus or a disease, which is extremely common? You could be carrying something without realizing you're carrying it. So if you have sex with somebody and it's unprotected and neither one of you makes any declaration of, you know, being STD free, you say, well, I, I, we didn't even talk about it. We started making out and before we knew it, we were, you know, mashing privates. Well, if nobody talked about it and then I gave you something, there's two moral classes to that possible outcome there. One, I knew I had something and I just decided not to bring it up. You might be able to find some blame there. Um, and I think it might be uh, reasonable to do so. In the other case, if I didn't know, I had no symptoms. I had no reason to believe I was health compromised in any way. And you didn't ask me, hey, have you ever had any unprotected sex or have you been tested recently? And you get something. Well, we're kind of at the same moral ground because we both had unprotected sex. It's not like I did it and you didn't. Unprotected sex by definition means both people didn't have protection. 
And if neither party spoke about any expectations or any health uh, knowledge prior to the uh, encounter, then both parties are on the same moral ground of if there's harm created in any direction, both parties took the same amount of precaution to prevent possible harm. Essentially none. So, I think when we can understand the STD case where you have a consensual act where there's an understanding that there's a possibility of transmitting a virus or a disease of some sort and people are negligent but there's mutual negligence they cancel each other out and there's no expectation on either side of accountability or retribution for any harm that may result from the encounter the same thing I think would result from you and me being total strangers sitting next to each other at a ball game. You know, um, you are not a fan of having uh, vaccinations and turns out you're carrying swine flu or measles and our team scores and we do a high five and I get your measles or your swine flu. Now, I go to the doctor, I find out I have measles or swine flu and I trace that first symptom back to the day after the ball game. I said, oh, maybe I got it from that guy I high-fived. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I got it from a germ I picked up in the bathroom or whatever. But again, for the sake of argument, let's say hypothetically there's some way to know, as a matter of fact, who or where it was that um, transmitted the virus or disease or whatever to a person, to you, to me. Um, so I know it was you that gave me, um, you know, measles when I, um, when I, uh, high-fived you at the ball game. We, I don't think we have a sufficient claim under the philosophical confines of what we understand with regards to the non-aggression principle to constitute the initiation of aggression. So it took me a little over 22 minutes to really knock down and do my best at sort of tackling the claim that Austin Peterson was making on his podcast just recently to the time of this recording, which is uh, the end of August 2016, that it's a violation of the non-aggression principle to give someone a disease or make someone sick when you don't get a vaccination. Now, of course, if I have a syringe with Ebola or AIDS or whatever and I inject you with it or I inject it into a steak and then cook it and serve it to you or whatever and you get sick, clearly that's different, right? I, I had the intent and I took, you know, I took action to cause you harm, or causing you harm was my goal, and my motive was to do things that would cause you harm, and then I succeeded. I mean, you have all the components there, you know, knowledge, intent, um, complicit action, causation, you have all these components that indicate blame under the initiation aggression, under what you consider blame under the non-aggression principle. If you come over my house, we play poker, and then I give you the flu, and then you miss a week of work, and you don't have any paid time off, and you lose $1,000 in wages, I don't think you have a sufficient claim against me, because I don't believe you have an expectation of good health everywhere you go. And I'll tell you why. This is, I guess, the last point I want to make. The disease is an entity onto itself. So it's like... It's like um, if you're in my backyard and you get stung by a bee, I don't think it's right for you to be able to sue me because there's no reasonable way for you to expect that I could keep all of the bees out of my backyard. In the same regard, I can't control where the flu germs are and if I have swine flu or not and to be vaccinated for everything under the sun. So even if you have the government mandating vaccinations to every single person, or even if you don't, in a free society, there, there's no way to cover yourself in such a way as to where someone can't get sick as a result of coming in contact with you. 
there could be some new strain of, of illness that you're the first case of, and then I pass it to you, the next person, and now you want to come sue me because, oh, you gave me a disease. Well, but I didn't even know I had it, and nobody even knew that it existed, and there was no possible way of um, preventing it or vaccinating for it. So that um, case right there gives us the uh, foundation for which we could build our understanding that it's not sufficient enough to be a part of the causal chain that leads to someone's harm. So you could be at my house and a meteor could fall from outer space and demolish the both of us. I don't think it would be fair for your family to sue my family or my next of kin or my wife or whatever for your dying in a meteor um, smashing into our, our house while you're over to visit. I didn't by any means call the meteor or choose for it to hit my house or, um, you know, dive out of the way and throw you in the path of the meteor. We were both caught off guard and smacked by it. So things that are outside my control that cause you harm can't be things that I do to initiate aggression. You can't be simultaneously unaware of a threat and also be initiating aggression. Just like if you're over my house and you're walking down the stairs and you're being careless and you slip and fall, well, I could have carpet on my stairs, I could have um, handrail. You could choose not to use the handrail. You could choose to be running or hopping on one foot. Just because you're in my home doesn't mean that any harm that comes your way is now automatically my fault. I have to have done something. Now, there is negligence, right? I could have poured petroleum jelly or lubricant, you know, motor oil all over my stairs and not told you or informed you and said, hey, run upstairs and get me something. And then I'm waiting and hoping that you're going to slip and fall. There could be a case made in that in that sense where, like I said, if I know I have um, some sort of STD and then we have sex unprotected and, and you say, well, you know, why didn't you tell me, you know, you went to the doctor. We have this proof that you were already diagnosed with X, Y, and Z condition. You know, you could have told me. Why didn't you tell me? That's a different case. I am talking about not getting vaccinated for everything under the sun and then I actually had something and I didn't realize, and then you get it from me. Austin was saying that that is a violation of the non-aggression principle, and hopefully in the past 28 and change minutes, I did a decent enough job building up to and sort of debunking and tackling and discrediting that claim that you could have violated the non-aggression principle by being negligent and getting a vaccine for something that you later unknowingly contracted and unknowingly transmitted. Um, a disease or a virus, more specifically, is its own biological organism, like a bee, but way smaller and way harder to detect. If a bee gets in my home or gets in my backyard and stings you as you, you're over to visit me, you don't have a legal or moral claim against me because you don't have that expectation to not be harmed wherever you go, whether you're at the mall, whether you're walking in the woods, or whether you're in my backyard. There's no way you can expect me to rid my property of all sorts of bees and spiders and ticks. Um, and I am not responsible for Mother Nature having an adverse effect on you. And in that same regard, if I am unknowingly a host of a virus, my decision to not go out and um, submit to or purchase a vaccination is in no way a willful act on my part to cause you harm. Nor is it a negligent act on my part to prevent harm because I don't have a duty to rid my body from all potential viruses or illnesses so that I could be um, non-complicit in harming others because those viruses are organic material which are part of mother nature which without my permission without my knowledge can use my body as a host and as a transmission mechanism to other people 
and I am not causally involved in such a way where I'm aware and willfully um, negligent in creating harm for you. So that's my case. I won't say that it's completely bulletproof or, um, you know, um, not prone to, uh, not susceptible to any kind of um, counterclaim or uh, retort. I would, would love to hear what other people have to say um, about this issue. Um, should people be required by government or by any sort of societal structure to get vaccinations? One. And two, if I give you a virus and I didn't know I had it, and I didn't intentionally try to give it to you overtly, is it fair to say or is it correct to say that I have initiated aggression against you by you contracting a virus that I was unaware I was transmitting? That's the philosophical discourse today on vaccines as regards Austin Peterson's chat with Psy Girl. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in for this little car video blog session. As always, please subscribe. I could always use more subscribers. And please share this video if you found it to be intellectually stimulating. And please, please, please give me your comments and feedback. I am doing this for discussion more than anything else. I want to intellectually stimulate my mind and yours and make us a more thoughtful and philosophical community writ large. Thanks again, guys. Peace out.